it's such a, an incredible thing because it, it, it is rare. And I don't know if you've met many other people who have gone from the, you know, extreme level of legally blind that you did to having sight like you do now. But, you know, I've, I've heard about it. I've heard stories, myths, but I, I haven't actually met somebody who's, who's really gone through it like you. And um, so I love that you're sharing your story. Hello, it's me just quickly jumping in here. I wasn't originally planning to make this two parts, but my conversation with Olivia was just so interesting and I really enjoyed it. And I wanted you guys to have the opportunity to see everything we had talked about. Um, so I split it into two parts to make it a little more digestible. Uh, so here it is, part two. If you haven't seen part one, I would recommend checking that out first. But uh, yeah, here you go. Part two of my conversation with Olivia, born blind and got her sight at 36. I know you, you talked about seeing somebody in a mirror and like or seeing yourself in the mirror and thinking it was somebody else. Like, did you just, did you struggle to adapt to how you look? Like seeing yourself for the first time? Yeah, because a lot of the people that uh, was around me when I was younger would call me, you know, just really, you know, horrible names. So they would describe me as this, this fat, ugly and stupid person. And then I'm like, all right, now I can see what I look like. And I'm like, um, how do I reconcile this? The negative talk that was installed as a child and how do I reconcile it now that I have some autonomy over how I look and who am I? So that's, you know, Ariel's mm. helped a lot with that because my teacher will be like, when I can do pull up or do something, they'd be like, oh, she'll just, it's like such a positive atmosphere. They'll yeah. just, like, the whole room will applaud and be like, you're so strong, you're so beautiful. And yeah. Did, did anybody, you know, along the journey of, of getting your sight back, did anybody like suggest therapy or resources for you to help readapt or, or adapt to a new way of living? So nobody in the medical field did. Uh, That's they're they're talking. just yeah. They're just like, okay, you're cured. And and they, my doctor's actually amazing um, because when I came in after the surgery, he was he was like so happy because he didn't expect for the surgery to be as successful as it was. And I I really he's a really great guy. Um, but I was going out to a concert with a really famous band, and I I played guitar when I was. Blind. I had a really great teacher that was great help coaching me because I was like, I can't see it. I start, and he would just anticipate it so I wouldn't have to mm. cry. So one of my guitar mentors, I was going out to meet with his band, and he's like, you're, you're going yourself, and you're happy, and you're, he's like, you have a different personality right now. <laughs> like, oh my god. And uh, the, the magnitude of that just blew my my brain up, and I forgot the question I was answering. Oh, <laughs> did, did um. <laughs> Like, did, did anybody along the oh. way suggest therapy or other resources to help you adapt? Yes. So, so all that was happening, he was, the doctor was happy. I just said, I need therapy. And I, I went and I did it. It took three tries to get somebody that got it. Mm. But I still, I'm not actively in therapy now because they would just feel like you're, I guess I have a really good survival instinct. I have a really good... I have a really interesting way of thinking where I look at things the same way I navigated when I was blind. So I'm like, here's the floor, here's the colors, here's the parts, let's look at the parts from a from a neutral point of view. And they're like, you're doing everything that you should be doing. And I was like, okay, I'm good. But it took me three years of therapy afterwards. And still I have good days and I have bad days. Yeah, of course. and and. And like I said, I, I love that you're so honest about that, that you're so open about the mental health struggles, the whirlwind of how your life has so dramatically changed. Because again, we put the idea of disabled people being cured on a pedestal as if it is the solution to our problems. But the way I always think about it is it, it actually just changes the problems, yes, right? It, it just shifts what your problems are. That's exactly it. You get it. So yeah. I was, I was, even, to, even today, I was like so afraid to come here because I was like, I have to drive. I have to meet new people. Oh my God. I hope I don't mess she up. She drives now, you yeah. guys. That's so crazy. I mean, of course, that's the one thing I think all of us blind people would love to be able to do. One day, one day with those self-driving cars, we'll get to do it without the sight, without the treatment and cures. Um, 
it's such a, an incredible thing because it, it, it is rare. And I don't know if you've met many other people who have gone from the you know extreme level of legally blind that you did to having sight like you do now. But you know, I've I've heard about it. I've heard stories, myths, but I I haven't actually met somebody who's who's really gone through it like you. And um, so I love that you're sharing your story. And by the way, she does have a brand new YouTube channel as well as a TikTok. I will link both of them down below because, you know, we can only talk about so much today, but she has a lot more to share. And I think what you're doing with your life now is so important. Was there something that you were like really excited to see? Like when you got your site back, was there one thing that you're like, I want to go see the New York City skyline. I want to go see the Mona Lisa at, you know, at the Louvre or I want to see myself. You know, like, what was there, I want to see my, my best friend smile. Like, what was that thing that you were like, that would be really cool to see? And oh. what was the experience like when you actually saw it? All of the Disney parks. And I've seen two of them so far. And I actually have a video on my YouTube channel about this. When I was four years old, and I'll tell it very quickly because it's a long version on the YouTube, my, the family that was raising me took their son to Disney World in Florida and I went with them and I didn't know what was going on. I was scared. I couldn't see. I was on the submarine ride and they had concave windows, which were the same as my glasses that I would later yeah. get. I stuck my little head into there and I saw a, like a diving frog man and I screamed because that was the first time I, I had ever had sight. And I absolutely wanted to see what the Disney parks looked like with the eyes actually surgically altered. Mm. And even to this day, it brings me comfort because it reminds me of that little girl that I was when I couldn't see and I'm still that person. So definitely the Disney parks, I'm a, I'm a bit of a nerd that way. All right, well, if anybody has a connection to the folks at Disney, we need to get Olivia to the parks that she hasn't gotten to see yet. I think that would be amazing. And you oh have to God. document it for all of us to see. I literally cry when I see something. <laughs> I'm like a little kid. <laughs> I love that. And driving, because driving is the thing that like I've always wanted to do. And like, yes, I've driven a few cars in my day, which is not legal, but I've done it anyways. Me and too. that um, makes me feel better that I was made to do that in an empty parking lot with yes. some relatives. I think I personally think every blind person should have a friend or family member take them to an empty parking lot and let them drive. It's like such a great experience and like just to feel like you've done it and you know what everybody else is talking about. Yes. But anyways, I digress. I did not just recommend everybody go do illegal things. No. Shh. Anyways, I've got to know though, because as much as I dream about driving and how great that would be, I also, every time I'm in a car, I'm like, I don't know how you said of people do it. Like this sounds scary it and is. overwhelming. And like you drive in Los Angeles, okay? Like traffic here is nutty. What is that experience like? Like, how do you feel? Are you ever scared behind the wheel? Like, are you ever still like, oh my God, I'm seeing so much. Yes. And I'm in such control of of this metal vehicle that could kill people. Like, is that terrifying? It, it, it really kind of is. After a while, you get you get adjusted to it and it becomes part of your normal. But you know, then in LA especially, you get the random traffic stop for no reason. So yesterday, like everything stopped. We were going 80 miles per hour or something because it was like the desert highway. And I was like, ah, <laughs> and it was fine. But yeah, it's, it's scary because they'll just do random U-turns here and it's like, uh, somebody's going the wrong way down the street and it's not me. <laughs> That's, I, I, yeah, I feel like, I feel like as much as I would dream of driving, it also low-key, honestly, terrifies me. I have to listen to music while I drive, even if it's just a, a, like across the parking lot because otherwise I get panic attacks. But if I'm listening to music, I love music. I mean, obviously we know why. Um, and then I'll just like jam out to my music. I'm like, I'm listening to music and playing a game. And that's how I rationalize it. I always get that anxiety before I get in the car. And then when I'm in and I'm going, I'm like, all right, don't look down. Don't look down. Look, at, that's a tightrope thing. Obviously I'm not looking down in my car. <laughs> I'm just like, got it. <laughs> so what you do today as a product manager in technology can you talk about some of the accessibility issues that you face when talking to engineers or big tech? So yeah, um, the thing that I find, and I, I'm in a group for disabled techies, so we find that a lot of big companies, they want to 
develop a product and they just don't take accessibility into account because they think it's too expensive. But there are people like me and people like the other people that I speak with in, in this field, we're really good at making this happen for pretty much the same or, or maybe even a very tiny budget more. Like it's not expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive because a lot of technology now, services that 10 or 20 years ago, you would need to completely build from scratch. Now you have third party systems that, okay, you can buy this system and integrate it in your product. You can buy this system and integrate it in your product this way. They have the accessibility kind of baked into them. So a lot of these companies will just turn accessibility off. And I have had conversations, not at my current job, at a previous one, and they were just like, yeah, um, we, we thought about that maybe in the future, but you know, it's, it's, it's too much money. And I was like, well, who told you it's too much money? Like, and serving your audience mm. completely make you money long-term and, and it's short-term thinking. Thank you. I love that you said that because we are customers. It like people act like say putting in the little bit of extra money to making something accessible. They act like that won't pay off. Like there won't now be more consumers of the product. Disabled people have money to spend. We also need to consume products to live, to enjoy life. And so by just ignoring us in your advertising, in your marketing, in your development of that product, you're alienating us and we're not gonna spend our money with you. But if you put the little bit of extra time a little bit of extra money you don't know how much further you know you will expand your potential customer base exactly and you know if even if somebody who is does have a disability is not buying the product somebody they they love may be buying the product and then they're gonna look at that and say I'm annoyed at this because my mother my brother my sister can't use it and you know, it's it's a ripple effect that goes on. It's, it goes further than just this is who the person is buying your products. Yes. Who is their family? Who is the culture? And if we just look at the inclusion movement now, we know it's a lot bigger than than we originally maybe had thought, or they had maybe had thought. And I I feel like with blindness, it is so hard. And I know you experience this mm -hmm. too. Tell, explaining to people what it is exactly and how it's different. It's a spectrum. It's, it's different, different for everyone. everyone. Yes, yes. And, you know, I see some of these companies advertising to disabilities that you can see. Yeah. So they might show somebody who, you know, is mix, missing an arm or they or in a wheelchair, which is great. But when it comes to people that have vision disabilities, you can't see that in a print ad. Yes. And I think that is why I felt, and I don't know if you agree or not, I, I feel that, you know, being being blind or low vision, I think that gets a, that gets left out. Like I can't We anymore. get forgotten about so often because exactly what you're saying. I mean, my management has quite literally been told by a company, well, if we put Molly on a billboard, nobody will see she's a minority because you can't tell she's disabled. It's not an assumption you're making, it is genuinely actually the truth. I'm, I'm making a face and I'm putting my head down on my hand and I'm just nodding like I, I have a headache right now. It's, yes. You know, it, 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 it is, um, we just get left out. And, and even, even when you just look at say the numbers, like we are a small group within a minority, like blindness is, is a, is a more um, unusual disability, even within disabilities. And so I think we just oftentimes, disabled people period, get left out of conversations a lot, get left out of advertising, marketing, um, representation in movies and TV shows. It's less than 2% of, of what's on TV today has disabled characters, period. Mm -hmm. um, and then so when you go into the subsections that breaking all the disabilities down and you see that we are, a small group within disability. Um, it's it's tough, but I mean, I, I, I like to think that with, with, with social media and with how many blind people are out here sharing our stories, with how many disabled people are out here sharing our stories and showing that we have followers, there is demand. People do wanna see this, people do wanna know about it, that it, it's gonna continue to create change. And I've, I've seen change just in the years that I've been doing this. 
you know, it's hard because sometimes it feels like as a community, we're literally not even crawling yet and other groups are running and it can feel so disheartening, but together we're so much stronger, you know? And when we, as a community, support each other, even with our differing opinions, even with our different backgrounds and, and situations, together we're so much stronger. And I, I, I get so sad when I see, you know, on blind talk or, or just on social media in general, blind people tearing down other blind people. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, if we tear each other down, how are we supposed to expect society to build us up? I agree. If we as a community can't even come together to support one another and say, you know what? Your opinion might differ from mine. Your experience might differ from mine. But we're, we're working towards the same thing, you know, which is equity. We're working towards representation. We're working towards accessibility, even when we're doing it in different ways. You know, supporting one another in the strives that we are making is, is so important as a community because we show people how to treat us. We teach society how to treat us. And when, when you act like a victim, and this goes for anybody, when you act like a victim, that's how you'll be treated. But when you act like a survivor, that's how you'll be perceived. That's why I try my best to just like own my disability and make the best of it because I want people to look at me and perceive my disability that way. You know, I love that. I don't want to be a victim of my situation and I don't want to crumble sometimes even though I really do want to inside because I don't want to I don't want to let people perceive me that way as as you know somebody who's giving up or giving in to my situation. And I just think as a community it's so important for us to support one another so we can show society that they need to support us. I love you that. Know? That is so like Oh God, and that's why I'm here. You know, I didn't collaborate with anybody else but you because I was like, when I saw you, I was like, yes, because I know you get it. And right now I'm wearing a gold necklace that has a lightning bolt that has uh, little sparkles on it and a little conch shell. And it's something I got off Etsy. And to me, it represents, I want to be able to help others and to help make an impact because I'm not blind anymore. I'm not, always low vision, sort of low vision, sort of not low vision, sort of 2025. I'm weird vision. I don't know what I'm called, but um, I definitely understand both perspectives. Right. And it's important to me to be supportive and lift other people up so that they can empower themselves and that we can empower each other. I just love what you said. You said it better than me. <laughs> I, speaking of, like, I'm curious, is there a way that you can describe what you see to us now? Oh, yes. So right now I have um, the lens implants that are in my eyes. They do not focus near and far. So I am focused. I asked the doctor to focus me to my iPhone when I'm reading it or my computer. So I'm focused till about here because I drove today, I have to wake up and say, what am I doing today? Well, I'm gonna drive. I'm not reading a book. So I put a lens in my right eye. That sees distance. My left eye sees up close. My left eye is supposed to be able to read, but it won't do it. It probably never will. So I usually have to magnify with my iPhone if there's small print in a store mm. um, or ask a friend. And so I am technically minus four without correction. Uh, he, with my right eye is twenty twenty five with the lens in, so it's complicated. Yeah, and it's. I mean, not it's it's easy. just as complicated as when you're blind trying to describe it, right? Like everybody's sight is is their own. Yes. Right. Like we we all have such different ways of seeing the world as blind people that it can be hard to 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 help other people understand. So I, I knew it would be a struggle. So uh, thank you for trying to explain it. Um, I'm curious to know, like, how you find people treat you differently. Oh yeah. In the world. Like how did they treat you before versus how do they treat you now? So I I feel like so I've met two other people that got their sight. Well, not met in person, but they one is in Florida and one is I think in Australia. And both of them have gotten their sight later in life. One got it in the fourth grade, so a lot younger than me. But we find that when it comes to dating, mm -hmm. when men find out we had the surgery, they back away pretty fast. And I was just like, the idea that you once were disabled. Yeah. Like, oh, 
god, like, I can't associate with somebody who was disabled. They're just like, whoa, that's heavy. Like, I'm out of here. And I was like, yeah, like, so I was like, you too? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. So it's almost like some people perceive us as like this circus animal, mm. this damaged good. This, like, for lack of a better word, like this freak. Yeah. Like this, like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's. That that that's crappy. I don't like it. Yeah. Um. But you know, in general, most... which just shows though, right? The stigma around disability. Yes. Like just the fact that you once were disabled has stigma. Yes. It's hard. So, um, my friends all treat me the same, and and I'm actually really excited because in three weeks, my best friend since I was ten years old, we're still close. She's visiting me, and uh, I have not seen her since I got my surgery. So, wow. Yeah. So I'm really excited. We talk every day. Like, so the, the people that were really like the, the ride or die people are the same. Um, I, I feel like when you're a single woman walking by yourself in society, people will push and shove you. Mm. I'm a little more alert to that. And I'm a little more like, well, no, I'm not putting up with this, you know, yeah. but, but it's, do you do you feel safer as, no. as a woman? No. <laughs> interesting. That's so interesting because I would think I would feel uh, safer be, as a as let's be real. You're never feeling safe as a woman in society in a yeah. big city like Los Angeles. But like I feel like I would feel at least a little bit safer being able to like see my surroundings. So it's interesting to hear you say that you don't feel safer necessarily. Yeah, and and I I blurted that out really loud, and I was just like I didn't even realize I was going to say that. I actually don't because it feels like there's like imagine like a snowstorm coming mm -hmm. down on your head and all the snowflakes hitting you that's what it feels like when I see now like there's so much and it's complicated and um, like when I saw the second Star Trek movie that just came out where there's a, a computer there's a computer generated scene in it and it's all overworked like you know and I'm just like they're like what happened in the movie I'm like I don't know I couldn't follow <laughs> like, that I could not figure out what I, I was seeing I, I, yeah yeah so it's like, it's like you can't you can't I always think of like sight as like like code yeah like you can't like uncode decode what you're actually seeing to make it make sense. Yeah, and it's almost like what I had when I was a child feels safer. So I, I am not a good singer, but I, I did practice singing and I couldn't sing after I got my sight. So I said, hold on a second to my teacher. I put a blindfold on and I was able to sing. Isn't that so interesting? <laughs> it's like you're, it's almost, almost like not being able to see is your comfort zone, Yes. right? Like relying on your other senses makes you feel safe and comfortable because for 36 years, that's what you knew. That's exactly right. It. So it's almost like seeing the world is actually more jarring or more scary at times for you than just not seeing it and being in your kind of bubble of, of knowing. I'm gonna tell you legitimately, your eye contact with the camera and me is better than mine. <laughs> I'm not even looking at them half the time. Hi. <laughs> That's so interesting. I, and I guess it's because I'm in my comfort zone. Like this is my normal, it's what I know, but I can't imagine your normal changing again at 36 yeah like that that really is it's a lot to go through um oh, I had another question I wanted to ask that I was I noticed that it's hard for me to it's hard for some people to relate to me I think because I don't have the same way of seeing as them or the same experience and if if you're if you're blind as you know they put you in your box if you're sighted they put you in the box they're like there's no box for this one <laughs> I I'm scared I'm gonna run away you're in your league of your very own yeah and I'm like oh that's why I was so happy well not ha maybe I don't know what I don't know if happy is the right word for it but I'm meeting other two other people that contacted me off TikTok that had a similar experience um, well you feel less alone right yeah. like it's it's a less lonely experience when there's people who have gone through which is the power of community Right, like that's why I, I'm so grateful I grew up with so many blind friends because when I lost the majority of my sight, it was at least in certain ways a little less scary knowing that I knew so many people who lived happily as blind people. But if you, if you don't have that community, it's so much more scary because it feels like us and them, Yeah, you know? So community is just so, so, so incredibly important. And even if you don't have that community, around you in your real life, that's what's so great about the internet is you can find that community now. And it's it's honestly part of why I wanted to start my YouTube channel seven and a half years ago was to, to build a community, to build a space on the internet that I didn't feel existed in the way that I wanted to access it through video. So um, 
please, if, if you're struggling to find your community, like they are out there, even no matter how niche you are, I promise there's somebody else like you, or at least somebody who can relate in ways that maybe other people in your life can't. So scour the internet because it's incredible the stories that exist out there that'll make you feel more seen and heard and understood and having those feelings I think is really important. And most importantly, if somebody's telling you that you're not perfect as you are today, uh, that's not good. There's some people, you know, people, I, I firmly believe that you are perfect as you are and, and where you're at. And I made the mistake of listening to people who said that I wasn't and my life did not go the direction that it should have gone in my opinion um, because of that, you know, feeling less than and I, that's a big thing for me, you know, your disability doesn't make you less than. Mm, absolutely. What do you wish, I have two, two questions we're going to end this on, what do you wish other blind people knew about getting sight back and what do you wish sighted people knew about quote curing disability wow I know big question <laughs> you can take you can take as so much time as you need so um, as far as blind people a cure doesn't mean you're going to be a sighted person's version of perfect it doesn't mean that it is necessarily going to improve your life. It's going to change your life. You're going to have to weigh the factors that you have in your personal situation and your physical situation on if it's the right choice for you. But I look at people's perspectives, even among sighted people. It's like every person exists in their own world, their own like almost parallel dimension, right? Even if they have sight people are people. So a blind person is in another perspective. Uh, a sighted person is in this perspective. If they live in New York, a sighted person in Florida is in that perspective in Florida. You're a product of your experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change just like it would change anybody's perspective if you change every aspect of their life. Like if somebody in Southern California moves to Japan and doesn't speak Japanese. Right. So the, I, I, I think that the mainstream looks at this as a miracle cure and that is not the case. It is a, it is a subtle change that accounts, amounts more like a lot of paper cuts to your body that changes you. I feel I love my life right now, but I don't know anything else. This is my normal. When I changed, I normalized to what this is. Mm -hmm. And I remember who I was and I still have her there. So you might have some duality and some body dysmorphia and definitely get therapy if you choose to get a, a and I, I don't like calling it a cure, but like a correction. Yeah. And as far as sighted, when you look, they look at me and they say, you're, you see just like me. I don't. And people understand the same thing. It's just a different, it's a different, different perspective that this person is in. And when you get your sight, your brain might not understand the information that you're seeing. So I'm seeing things, but I'm not seeing the same way that a sighted person is. It didn't mean that my life was well, I'm, you know, going to go on a, a vacation and I'm going to have this amazing life now and, and everything. I had, I, you know, I lost a lot of relationships. I lost my job. I had to learn how to do laundry, learn how to cook. I had to learn how to pay rent. I had to learn how to live because I was always with other people. Right. So imagine being 36 and missing your 20s. Yeah. Or, I mean, missing... 20s, 30s, teens. Exactly, like, yeah. You know, if, if you, again, weren't given the ability to have accommodations and training as a blind person, you were very dependent on the support of others yes. because you weren't empowered to do to do it yourself. And that so, is it. yeah, you, you really, truly had to learn to be an adult person. That is it. That not is it. not just a sighted person, just a person. Exactly. And, and you really hit it right there directly where I was not empowered when I was blind or legally blind or low vision, whatever phase I was in, I was not empowered through accessibility. 
I was treated like I was stupid and I was discarded because of the situation I was in that had poverty and the American healthcare system attached to it. Mm. And if I had been empowered to do that, I may have learned because obviously blind people can pay can their rent. Exactly. They can they can do laundry. That is not hard. So that's why it's a unique thing to me. Yes. But it was hard for you because you weren't given the opportunities to learn how to do it. Exactly. And so maybe my, the takeaway here, and you just you just crystallized this for me, the takeaway for sighted people is don't treat a disabled person like a child. Empower them to do mm -hmm. everything that they can because when you do things for them, you're stealing from them. You're stealing their autonomy from them, which they are perfectly capable of doing. Yes. Because blind people and I, I could speak from my blind experience, I was able to, I was an MMA fighter for five years while I was blind. I was a technologist while I was blind. I do a presentation where I speak and I list all of my accomplishments. I founded three events and I did all of this stuff while I was blind and people are like, how is that possible? But my, my thing to sighted people is it is possible because... And think of how much more you could have done. Oh, yes. If you had actually been given access to a cane, to braille, to, you know, learning more skills, right? Yes, exactly. And so that is a thing. It is... Sighted people tend to think that people with disabilities can do less than they can do, but they can do more... Yes. ...than anything that I've seen online. They can just... they. It's I actually I it. heard a blind person today on TikTok while I was scrolling getting ready this morning and she said I know sighted people mean this as a compliment but it's not how it comes off when they say to us as blind people wow I can't even do that and I'm sighted oh. and it is it's it's basically their way of like admitting that they kind of assumed blind people can't do xyz but I always try to remind people that like what I can do as a blind person doesn't mean an, another a blind Olivia could do it and what sighted Olivia could do doesn't mean sighted Molly could do it right like we are also just people yes we are blind but we are people and all people sighted blind disability not disabled have different opportunities in life have different skill sets in life a lot a lot of people who are sighted can't do their makeup very well a lot of people who are blind can't do their makeup very well a lot of sighted people can do their makeup very well a lot of blind people can do their makeup very well these aren't like blind or sighted exclusive things these are just it's just simply a skill set that some people in life possess and some people in life don't and that's how whenever i have like a lot of guilt around not being very good at cooking I'm, I always try to remind people, like, it's not because I'm blind. Yes, my blindness makes cooking much harder, but it's not the reason I'm, I'm not good at it or I get discouraged by it. it. It's part of the reason. But even if I was sighted, I don't think it's something that I would necessarily really get excited by or love or want to do or be very good at. It's just a skill that my blindness might make a little bit harder, but isn't the reason I don't possess it, Correct. you know? And I, I love what you were saying about, like, you, you need to give disabled people autonomy because I, I, of course, have a lot of parents of disabled children who watch me. Hi, able-bodied parents of disabled children. I'm so glad you're here on this channel. I, you know, I get a lot of them saying things to me like, have you ever lived alone because my, my daughter's blind and I never want her to live alone. Oh. And things like that make me feel so sad, you know, and, and I'm, I, I know that, that that mother has like the best of intentions and the goodest of hearts, but you need to let your daughter fall and scrape her knees, yes. you know? And I'm so fortunate the best thing my parents ever did for me was let me be a kid and let me run to the top of, of the playground. Even when they were scared, I would fall off. And did I injure myself sometimes? Yeah, but did my sighted brother? Yes, you know, and you, you've you got to let your kids live. You've got to let your kids have experiences. You can't rob them of those. I know it's scary because they're living in a world that is so foreign to you as an able-bodied person and able-bodied people often struggle to imagine living life or doing day-to-day -day things without the reality that they know. And it's okay. But it's, it's okay to have those feelings and those fears, but it's not okay to let your feelings and your fears of unknowing interrupt your child's ability to grow and flourish in life, you know? So 
I'm really glad you brought that up and I'm really glad I've been able to have you here on this channel. This has been such an incredible conversation. Thank you for sharing your insights, for sharing your experience authentically and honestly. We need a voice like you. And please follow Olivia over on TikTok and on her brand new YouTube channel. Um, and I'm sure if you have any questions, she'll be happy to answer them over there. And uh, until next time, you can click right here to watch this video or over here to watch this one. Bye guys. Bye.